Hello, my name is Kevin Pierce with Expo. Today, I'll be going over OSA best practices. So what am I talking about when I mean OSA best practices? Essentially, what we're going to cover here as far as topic go is what is an OSA? What is an optical spectrum analyzer? What does it do for me? What's the difference between a passive and an active network? And what are some of the critical parameters that an OSA looks at that we care about? And then at the very end, I'll do a quick setup. After this video, there will be another video that talks about the results. So we'll get deeper in, into those. Uh, but these are the topics that we're going to cover today. So what is an OSA? It's an optical spectrum analyzer, as I mentioned before. And essentially, how it differs from some of the other tools that you use in your system is really important to understand. So just a standard power meter just reads, you know, basically a broadband signal. So you set it for a specific wavelength and it'll try to measure what's at that wavelength or within that range uh, based on what you tell the, the meter what the wavelength is. A channel checker will look at individual channels. So if you're in a channelized system, you'll be able to separate the different ITU wavelengths or the CWDM wavelengths and read each of those channels or wavelengths independently and identify them as well. What a spectrum analyzer brings, it does all of the previous stuff, but it also introduces much more spectral analysis capabilities, such as looking at optical signal to noise ratio, which is a very, very critical parameter that we care about. And so um, from a very high level, that's what an OSA does for you. We'll get into a little bit more details when we talk about critical parameters, but what is the difference between a passive and an active system? From a test set perspective, on a passive system, we traditionally see power meters and channel checkers, DWDM, CWDM, OTDRs for those passive device, like testing through a WDM filter that is passive, right? Active systems, we're talking about nodes, anything that's powered or active systems that generate signals. And so if we look at, say, a standard network, and so this is a remote fine network, you know, we have different mixes of active and passive devices. And so what I have here is I have an OSA down here in the bottom right, and I have a channel checker up here. And so these will vary uh, on use depending on whether or not it's an active or passive system. So of course, a spectrum analyzer can work on a passive system and has value there, but traditionally we see it being used more for active systems with many of our customers, with the passive stuff more traditionally going towards channel checkers. So when I'm looking at an OSA, where I'm typically seeing them being used is um, within the, act, the, the network where there's active systems, right? So we actually have active systems like a fiber node or something like that, uh, or a remote FI device. This is where an optical spectrum analyzer has a lot of value. When we start looking at things like the channel checker there, this is where we start seeing it at filters and passive devices. Uh, on the receive side, looking at, you know, some of the measurements coming in, the channels coming in. So this is where we see the two uh, test sets fitting in. So that's why it's important to understand the difference between a passive and an active network. <clears throat> and so what are the critical parameters? What are the critical parameters that my OSA is looking at? The first one is center wavelength. So this is essentially verifying that your wavelength is where it should be, that it's passing through the filter appropriately. So basically center wavelength. For CWDM systems, we typically see, you know, right off a of center wavelength between two to four nanometer drift separation. For DWDM systems, typically 0 0.03 nanometers to 0 0.05 nanometers uh, off a of central wavelength. So those are some values that you, that you might see. And so if it gets outside of some of those parameters, we start getting into unacceptable drift. And so this is what we use central wavelength for, is just to verify that we are, you know, very, you know, right on that ITU channel or, or very, very close to it and not drifting off of that. As far as channel power goes, channel power is basically looking at individual channels, uh, you know, based on a wavelength. So a specific ITU channel, you know, uh, for instance. Uh, and really what's important with channel power is it allows us to look at um, how we're sharing channels, right? Uh, what's the max channel and what's the lowest power channel? Um, that we're looking at. And so um, what's an acceptable channel power really does vary depending on your receiver sensitivity, but it is important to know what those individual channel powers are and an OSA can do that. To kind of tailor onto that, 
we have channel flatness. So channel flatness is to see if the channels are balanced or sharing evenly. Uh, this is critically important because this will tell you, you know, whether or not your amplifier gain has an imbalance, uh, you know, those types of things, or where some channels are using more power than others. So we look for a flatness in the channels with a spectrum analyzer. And last but certainly not least is OSNR, optical signal to noise ratio. Um, really, you know, this is an initial reading that will tell you how you're going to perform when you do a bit error rate test or something like that. Uh, it's really the quality of your signal is what we're looking at. And, you know, the million dollar question is, what is a good OSNR? Well, this is not a simple answer. On the transmitter side, you'll have a higher OSNR because you have a nice clean signal. It's pre-amplification. You might see 40, 50 dB of, uh, of OSNR. As you cascade your EDFAs, your amplifiers, you introduce more and more noise. By the time you get to the receiver, then your channel, your, your OSNR might be down in the 15 dB range. And so understanding your network and the type of systems that you deploy out there, um, you know, will really lead you to understand better what your OSNR should be. And a lot of things impact that. The level of your bit error rate uh, uh, expectations, right? Uh, the amount of uh, insertion loss and the amount of components in the system. Um, all of these things and the noise and the amplification will affect what the OSNR should be. So let's go ahead and look at an, a screenshot of a single ITU channel that I took earlier today. Uh, so this is just one channel that we see on the display right now. And again, to recap our four critical parameters, we want center wavelength as one, and I'll just abbreviate these for the sake of time. Uh, channel power. So we have channel power is number two. Um, we have flatness. And then we have OSNR. So these are, again, the four critical parameters. What is center wavelength? Center wavelength is essentially, we go in there and we measure where is the center of this waveform. You know, is it 1555.57? Stuff like that. So that's just center wavelength. Channel power, we go in here and measure what the channel power is. Right, so we, we measure what this channel power is, and so this one's roughly around negative nine dBm. Right, so that's roughly what that individual channel power is. And then we look at flatness. So if we had multiple waveforms here, we would look to see how they're sharing power. Right, and so we're looking for some sort of flatness going on there. We want to make sure that they're fairly balanced or even and not too far off of delta there. Uh, so that's what flatness does. OSNR is optical signal to noise ratio. So this is an indication uh, of where the noise floor is using an IEC and analysis method. So essentially what we do is we take, you know, the signal and then compare it to the noise, right? How far we are from the noise. And so this is OSNR, optical signal to noise ratio. So those are the different parameters, critical parameters that are measured. And so you know, as you cascade EDFAs, as you add more amplification into your system, you're going to see that your noise starts to climb and climb and your signal starts to come down. So in this example here, we have four hops or four cascaded EDFAs. By the time it gets to the end, you can see here where we're, we don't have a lot of margin between our signal and noise ratio here. Uh, so that's really important to understand um, why you're doing this test. And so a quick setup. And so I'm going to run through a quick setup and you'll realize just how simple an, uh, a spectrum analyzer is. So I'm going to switch over to my VNC client here. So now that we know what an OSA is and where to use it uh, and some of the critical parameters, I'm going to show you how to set one up really quickly. So I have the FTB1 Pro platform with the FTBX 5235 OSA module. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and switch over to the OSA here. And essentially what I'm going to do is I have a DWDM OTDR that is transmitting a single ITU channel, channel 20, uh, into my spectrum analyzer. So I'm just going to go in there real quick and hit this discover button. And what the discover button does is really quickly it's going to go in, look at the entire spectrum, identify any channels, and then focus in or adjust the wavelength range to those channels. And you see how quickly, you know, quickly it did that. It located one ITU channel. And all I did was a single acquisition. You can also do averaging to get slightly better OSNR results or real time. In this case, I was just doing a quick snapshot and I get my results here. But if you notice, I don't have any pass fail indicators. You can manually set up how much drift, what your OSNR should be, your channel flatness, all that stuff. Uh, you can set that up 
uh, yourself. Or what I'm going to do here is over to the right, I'm going to go to analysis setup. And then to the very end here, uh, where it says favorites, I'm going to select on favorites and we have some predefined channels in here. So I know this particular channel that I'm transmitting is one of the ITU 100 gigahertz channels. So I'm going to go ahead and select that um, configuration. And then down here at the bottom, I'm going to hit apply settings. So this is going to apply the settings from that channel list to my results. And so when I hit OK here, we go back to the uh, uh, results. And then you'll see that we now have a pass fail indicator here. And so we can see the wavelength, the signal power. We know that it's channel 20. So we, we see that, you know, that it's identified as channel 20. Um, and in the next session, when we talk about results, I'll go deeper into, you know, what, uh, what we're expecting and how to more, you know, how to analyze these results. And so this is just a quick single acquisition here using Discover. If I wanted to do a drift test over time, then I can go over here to where it says mode. And if I select mode and I switch from WDM to drift, I'm now doing, you know, doing a drift test. And so uh, we're transitioning over to that. And essentially, I'm going to do one single acquisition, but I need to set some drift settings. And so the three primary settings are delay. So after I hit start, when do you want me to start doing the test? So if, if you want it to start in 12 hours uh, in the middle of the night, you can do that. And how often do you want it to test? So this one's every 10 seconds. And for how long? One minute. Now, obviously, you would use longer settings than this, maybe 24 hours, maybe 12 hours, whatever. In this example, I'm just going to do that. And then essentially, all you do is hit start. And then it'll start to do its drift analysis and capture historical data. So after the first acquisition is completed and, and, uh, and pulled in, then we'll start to see some historical information start to populate. As we get more and more sampling in there, then we can start to see uh, long-term historical information. So you can see what we see here. Uh, we can set some pass-fail thresholds, current drift, maximum, those types of things. And essentially, you know, that's how you quickly set up an OSA, right? It obviously does a lot more than that. Uh, but we really just wanted to kind of show you the easy use. And this is probably, quite honestly, going to be um, largely what you use it for is those two uh, uh, test configurations. Going in there and identifying the channels that are present, looking at the health and the quality of those signals. And then if you want to do some advanced troubleshooting or any real-time adjustments of your signal, then you can go to, to real-time mode. And if you look at historical information, you can go into drift mode. And, um, and that's basically it in a nutshell. Right. Uh, that is OSA best practices. My name is Kevin Pires. Thank you very much.